Now, my teaching strategy is to guide you through the subject in such a manner that it will facilitate conceptual learning. I do not believe that flooding you with a lot of information uh, can be an effective teaching learning um, methodology because, uh, because if I do not connect the dots, then you'll probably forget most of the information I convey you. So I'm going to discuss a little bit protein crystallography because uh, most of the GPCR structure and functions were deciphered by crystallographic studies. First, I'll introduce you to protein crystallography using some animated videos and then I'll guide you through the steps leading to our understanding of the mechanistics involved in GPCR G protein mediated cell signal transduction. Now to decipher molecular structure of a GPCR, you need a super high resolution microscope, but not an optical microscope, rather an X-ray uh, uh, X-ray based microscope, which is basically crystallography in a very simple, simplistic form of definition. Now, as you know, that resolution of a microscope is defined as the shortest distance between two points on a specimen that can still be distinguished by the observer or camera system as separate entities. Thus, using a 100x objective in an optical microscope, you can have a resolution of 0.2 micrometer. That means you can see uh, cellular structures in details, uh, but you will not be able to see the ultrastructure, the very fine details of subcellular particles or subcellular organelles. Uh, for example, the Christie of the mitochondria. For that, you need wavelengths which are shorter than blue light. For example, you need an electron microscope where a beam of electron is accelerated through a potential of 4200 kilovolt and passed through a strong magnetic field that acts as a lens uh, to converge the beam of electrons and construct an uh, image of the object. Thus, the resolution of a transmission electron microscope is about 0 0.2 micro, 2 nanometer, uh, which is good for uh, looking at the ultrastructure of subcellular organelles, uh, bacterial or viral structures. But to observe the atomic structure, you need a smaller wavelength, for example, X-ray, because uh, the wavelength of X-ray is uh, in the range of 0 0.5 to 2.1 uh, 2.5 angstrom, which is in the range of atomic diameters. But the problem is with X-ray is that uh, there is no lens system that can converge the diffracted light to construct an image of the molecule. And the scientists can actually achieve that by looking at the diffraction pattern um, when they shine an X-ray on, on, on a collection of molecules, which is a crystal, and then they, they deconstruct the structure uh, by mathematical models. So in the next video, I'll, uh, the next video, uh, the crystal protein, the, the strategies or fundamentals of protein crystallography is very nicely explained. Uh, let's have a look. Now this video was uh, prepared in the laboratory of Professor Elspeth Garman at University of Oxford. And in this video, she takes us on a journey into the world of crystallography from protein production uh, and purification to growing the right type of crystals. And uh, she will actually explain some fundamentals of uh, protein crystallography in this video. And this video is also av is available in the YouTube and I actually downloaded it from there. So let's have a look. This is a three-dimensional structure of a protein called lysozyme. It represents the order of nature, um, and I feel awed when I look at it. It's an enzyme that's in our tears and saliva and mucus, and it helps us fight bacteria. And knowing this three-dimensional structure helps us to understand the mechanism of action of this enzyme, and therefore how it helps fight bacteria in our bodies. Unfortunately, the size of the molecule is such that it's far too small for us to see under a light microscope or with our naked eye. Because the wavelength of light is much, much larger than the size of this tiny molecule. For that reason, we have to use radiation that's much smaller in wavelength 
and we use x-rays to look at these molecules. These are protein crystals. Locked within each crystal are millions of protein molecules, all arranged in an ordered grid-like structure. By firing x-rays at these and measuring how they scatter, we can work out the molecular structure of nearly any crystallized sample. It's through this method, known as x-ray crystallography, that some of the most important biological structures have been obtained from the double helix of DNA to numerous proteins, vitamins and drugs. But getting from a crystal to something like this, the structure, is not at all trivial and it can take a long time to grow a suitable crystal. Now we're in the protein production and purification lab because before we can set up crystallization trials, we need to produce enough protein for that process. We do this by genetically modifying E. coli bacteria, which then acts as a little factory to produce our protein in large flasks of broth, which we incubate. Once that's happened, we break open the cells, extract the protein, and then purify it, ready for the crystallization process. So why do we need to grow crystals of our protein molecules before we can shine x-rays at them and try and find the three-dimensional structure of them? Well, if we imagine that this string of beads is a protein molecule made up of 20 different amino acids, different color of beads that are found in nature, this folds up in a very complex, complicated manner in the three-dimensional shape like this. And if we look at one of these, true biological molecule here, a real one, what this metal model represents is a string through the beads and you can see it starts at this end and it follows a pretty torturous path going around here that you'd never imagine when you just look at the string of amino acids and the other end of it comes out here. Now it turns out that if I take a tube here with my protein in it that I've purified and prepared there's millions and millions of protein molecules in there. And if I shine x-rays at it, the x-rays will scatter off in all sorts of random directions and I won't get any information about the shape of the molecule within the tube. However, if I can get the protein molecules to line up in an ordered array, such as in a crystal, where they're all lined up in the same orientation, when the x-rays scatter from the crystal, then I can get enough information, the signal is strong enough for me to get the three-dimensional structure of the protein. We've now come down to the crystallization lab to look at how we crystallize protein. In this Petri dish, I've got some super saturated sodium acetate, and that means that there's so many molecules crowded in this solution, it's almost not holding the molecules and it wants to solidify. And if I hit it with this spatula here, you can see that it crystallizes. We get a fantastic pattern as it crystallizes across the dish. Essentially, this is what we try to do with our proteins, which is to produce a supersaturated solution of the protein and we dehydrate in a very controlled manner. The proteins we work on here, unfortunately, can be sometimes really difficult to crystallize. So we load small volumes of the protein into trays like this with different additives, but we have robots that help us do that by pipetting small volumes into these trays. Once we have the tray with the protein and additives in, we take it round to this crystal hotel, which holds the tray for several weeks at four degrees centigrade, and also monitors whether we have crystals or not um, by photographing the tray drops regularly.
But that's only part one of the story, because once we finally manage to grow a protein crystal, we then have to take it for X-ray analysis. And from the data we obtain, we try to generate a structure of our protein molecule, such as this one of lysozyme. But the protein structures we work on today are far more complex, and they can produce very small and delicate crystals. So to study them, we have to take them to extremely powerful X-ray sources at specialist facilities, such as the diamond light source. It's only once we get our crystals there that the next stage of our journey can truly begin. The most expensive and sophisticated scientific facility ever built in the UK. The instrument in this building can produce X-ray beams powerful enough to peer right into the atomic heart of all kinds of matter. This is a protein crystal. It's pretty small, at just one-tenth of a millimetre thick, but the millions and millions of protein molecules stacked inside it are even smaller. Biologists doing X-ray crystallography. This is a technique that allows us to look at the structure of any biological molecule that we can crystallize. The secret of success is growing crystals, which form when molecules pack together into highly ordered structures. This ordering of the molecules means that when we fire x-rays at a crystal, it diffracts or scatters the beam into hundreds of intense rays. The resulting diffraction pattern, detected as an array of spots, is dependent on the internal structure of the crystal. And by measuring the intensities and positions of these spots, we can work back to the structure of the molecule it is made from. It's a method that has opened our eyes to life at the molecular level. X-ray crystallography isn't a particularly new technique. In fact, it's been around for about a century. In the early days, crystallographers used simpler X-ray generators and photographic plates like this one to record their diffraction patterns. Back then, X-ray generators were much weaker and this tended to limit the technique to larger crystals which could usually only be grown from smaller and simpler protein molecules. Even then, it could take hours or sometimes days to record all the diffraction patterns needed to solve the crystal structure of a protein. But today, with synchrotrons as powerful as diamonds, we can use much smaller crystals, down to only five thousandths of a millimeter in size, which is often what you have to do if you're trying to study larger and more complex proteins. Here at the core of the synchrotron is a particle accelerator ring that accelerates electrons to close to the speed of light. The ring itself is around 560 meters in circumference and dotted around it are undulators like this one. Powerful electromagnets within this pipe force the electrons to wiggle from side to side as they pass through. And as they wiggle, they produce an intense pulse of electromagnetic radiation in the form of X-rays. And that pulse of X-rays shoots straight into one of the lead-lined experimental hutches where visiting scientists carry out their diffraction experiments. During the experiment, the crystal, which is mounted on the end of this little pin, is cooled by ultra-cold nitrogen gas from this nozzle to help it withstand the punishing radiation. This allows us to take much longer exposures which are needed when working with very small crystals. The X-rays from behind emerge here and are scattered by the crystal into many different angles. The diffracted rays are captured on this detector which can record up to 25 images a second, much faster than the photographic plates that we used to use. So what do we do with this information? 
How do we convert these diffraction patterns into molecular structures? Well, I can see my crystals down a microscope like this fairly easily. What I'm doing here is using lenses to make a magnified image of a tiny object. And that works because the lens can recombine or focus the light scattered from an object to make an enlarged image. Because a molecule is much smaller than the wavelength of light, I'm never going to be able to see it using an instrument like this. Instead, we use X-rays, a form of light that has a wavelength about the size of an atom. But there are no lenses to focus X-rays, so we use our mathematical understanding of how light scatters to do the work of the lens for us. And that allows us to work backwards from the diffraction pattern to a three-dimensional image of the protein in the crystal. What we end up with are three-dimensional maps which plot the electron density of the protein molecule and this reveals its branched, chain-like structure. The resolution of these maps is dependent on the quality of your crystal. The better they are, the more accurate your model is likely to be. Originally, crystallographers would painstakingly build these 3D models by hand, but now we rely on computers to generate them. With good quality data, these maps are stunningly detailed. You can see the lumps and bumps of every atom, every twist and turn of the protein chain. Even after you've spent your time at Diamond and solved your protein structure, you've really only taken the first step on a much longer journey towards understanding how it works. But from these sorts of investigations, we can learn how the biological molecules of your body interact with one another, or how to design drugs that will bind to them more effectively, or even to design proteins that nature never got around to inventing. Even after a hundred years, these are still exciting times to be working in structural biology.